When thinking of American old money dynasties, you may know families like the Rockefellers, the Kennedys and the Vanderbilts, storied names that have adorned the country's cultural and political fabric. Yet, lurking behind these more publicized dynasties is the saga of the DuPont family, a lineage that arguably eclipses them all in wealth and influence. Now, the DuPonts first burst onto the American scene in the early 1800s as French immigrants with a keen eye for the untapped promise of a burgeoning nation. While most stories of this era feature settlers striving for basic survival, from the beginning, the DuPonts aimed higher, a gunpowder empire set in their sights. And that's just the opening act. As the 19th and 20th centuries rolled in, so too did the DuPonts' levels of immense power and prestige. Indeed, the family delved into arenas far beyond gunpowder, chemicals, materials, science, and even armaments. But what happens when a family steeped on the brink of becoming old money has to learn how to navigate scandals, market crashes, and the unyielding march of technological progress? In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll explain that and more as we describe in sordid detail how the Dupont family went from new money to old money. Our saga commences in 1739 Paris, where Pierre Samuel Dupont emerges, a figure molded from humble origins yet infused with unrelenting ambition. You see, the mid-18th century in Paris was rife with socio-economic contradictions, with the opulence of the aristocracy clashing with the impoverishment of the lower classes, and all against a backdrop of intellectual enlightenment and cultural awakening. Despite the austerity shadowing his early years, Pierre Samuel's educational aspirations flourished, nurtured by parents who recognized and fervently nurtured his intellectual propensities. Certainly from youth, his intellectual curiosity was insatiable, perhaps fueled by an internal drive to transcend his modest upbringing, or possibly an innate quest to fathom the intricacies of human society. Without a doubt, this early brilliance was particularly noticeable in areas like economics and philosophy, disciplines that would later anchor the DuPont family's monumental rise. Now, Pierre Samuel soon entered the intellectual crucible of the Collège de France, a hub of progressive thought. There, he immersed himself in the advanced theories of his time, methodically sculpting a formidable foundation in economics and philosophy. And after years of studious investment, his academic endeavors bore fruit. His seminal writings, specifically those exploring the complex interplay between economic structures and human behavior, became revolutionary texts in academic circles. And these works didn't merely garnish applause, they sparked fervent debates among scholars and thinkers alike. Furthermore, his scholarly achievements did more than win him academic acclaim, they propelled him into the corridors of political influence. His essays and treatises earned him advisory roles to key figures within the French governance including ministers and perhaps even members of the royal court. Once there, his insights shaped not only intellectual dialogues, but also influenced practical policymaking, making him a distinguished luminary of his time. But as history evolved, so did France's political backdrop. The cataclysmic onset of the French Revolution in 1789 plunged the nation into a vortex of volatility. And while initially an advocate of revolutionary ideals, Pierre Samuel's faith waned as the movement spiraled into zealous excesses. When he found himself incarcerated by the revolutionaries in 1797, the writing was on the wall. France, once a sanctuary, had turned treacherous. Confronted with this stark reality, Pierre and thus the Dupont family undertook a momentous decision that would recast their fate. They selected the United States as their sanctuary in 1799. Strategically speaking, this choice wasn't driven by mere desperation, but by a calculated vision. They perceived America as a cradle of untapped potential, a refuge where political perils could not shackle their ambitions. Thus, they set sail for a land draped in the promise of renewal. Yet, the DuPont's journey to America was not without blemishes of suspicion. Rumors circulated about their political alignments back in France, some speculated that Pierre Samuel secretly sympathized with radical Jacobins, notorious for leading the reign of terror. However, a scrutiny of historical accounts dispels these doubts. In fact, Pierre Samuel Dupont was a figure of nuanced ideologies. He neither espoused Jacobin ruthlessness nor condoned monarchical rigidity. He navigated a path in alignment with his principles, rejecting both extremities in a life that was anything but ordinary. Now, 
the early 1800s United States that the DuPonts planted their flag in was a youthful nation on the cusp of industrial emergence. Pierre Samuel Dupont, then a French expatriate teeming with unyielding resolve, had decided within just three years of setting foot on American soil to establish a venture. The history books thus marked the 19th of July in the year 1802 as a momentous date that would herald in the inception of E.I. Dupont de Nemours and Company. Furthermore, the socio-economic conditions of the era were propitious for Dupont's entrepreneurial leap into gunpowder manufacturing. America's westward expansion, coupled with escalating geopolitical tensions, made the domestic production of the family's future cash cow product, gunpowder, not merely viable but indispensable. Moreover, the US market was primarily reliant on British imports, revealing a gap that begged to be filled. Even today, we can envision a gunpowder mill in Wilmington, Delaware, a daring endeavor in a landscape where the complexities of gunpowder manufacture loomed large. At the time, the British had firmly established themselves as the reigning giants of this volatile trade. Nevertheless, Pierre Samuel Dupont remained unwavering in his quest for a competitive stronghold. His audacity to challenge established industrial might displayed his acumen for business and an intrinsic understanding of market dynamics. And in carving out this niche, Dupont not only offered a domestic alternative, but also seized a chance to contribute to America's burgeoning self-reliance, aligning his own destiny with that of a nation in ascendance. Now, Pierre's recipe for success extended beyond mere ambition into the realm of astute strategy. His chosen location by the Brandywine River was meticulously planned, with the river offering the dual advantage of powering the mill and facilitating an efficient distribution network for his gunpowder products. Further complementing this was Pierre Samuel's relentless focus on quality. He imported seasoned professionals from France, ensuring that the company's operations were steered by expertise. Cutting-edge machinery became a signature feature of the mill, setting it apart from competitors. However, the journey was not devoid of setbacks. The War of 1812 temporarily bolstered demand, but the post-war landscape was less forgiving, forcing the company to diversify into realms like black dye and sulfuric acid. By the 1830s, the focus sharply shifted. DuPont pivoted his operations toward manufacturing black powder for leisure and sporting activities, a high-stakes bet that yielded significant dividends, and the company soon emerged as the foremost supplier of black powder within the United States. But the ingenuity didn't halt there. In 1834, DuPont broadened his portfolio, entering the textile industry with a new mill on the Brandywine River, purposed for cotton yarn production. This strategic move resonated with the rapid growth of America's textile sector and catapulted DuPont into a significant market role in cotton yarn. Yet this part of the story is punctuated with ethical quandaries. The 1840s saw DuPont becoming enmeshed in the American slave economy as slave labor was used in its cotton mills and its gunpowder ended up in the arsenal of slaveholders. Thus, a dichotomy of moral stances existed within the company. Pierre Samuel Dupont was an ardent opponent of slavery, whereas others like Eleuther Irene Dupont were slaveholders themselves. However, questionable ethics notwithstanding, in the coming decades the Dupont lineage set forth their next major chess move, one that would catapult them into the echelons of America's most powerful and affluent families. Now, the American Civil War offered a critical juncture. The Union Army was in dire need of gunpowder. Recognizing the opportunity, the DuPonts secured profitable contracts, becoming an indispensable supplier in the war machinery. Indeed, the family didn't merely capitalize on this moment, they revolutionized it. With remarkable alacrity, the DuPonts expanded their production capabilities to satiate the burgeoning demand. By the cessation of hostilities, they had ascended to become the globe's preeminent gunpowder manufacturer. Their coffers swelled, marking their transition from wealthy entrepreneurs to American financial aristocracy. Yet, this ascent was not without its dark clouds. As the 19th century waned, the DuPonts diversified their influence beyond mere commerce, crafting a multi-pronged strategy to permeate political spheres. For instance, one notable milestone was the marriage of Eleuther Irene Dupont and Alice Bellin in 1890. Alice, daughter of an esteemed Delaware politician, functioned as a conduit, 
providing the DuPonts a direct line to Delaware's political sanctums. However, the family's tendrils extended well beyond state lines. Henry Algernon DuPont, another scion of the family, took on a significant diplomatic role as the US minister to Italy from 1893 to 1897. These strategic affiliations and prestigious appointments were the cornerstones that anchored the DuPont family's political sway. But luminosity often draws shadows, and the DuPonts were no exception. As they reveled in the financial windfall accrued during the Civil War, they faced allegations of war profiteering. Critics claimed that the family had exploited the Union's desperation, levying exorbitant prices for their gunpowder supplies. But the DuPonts countered, asserting that their pricing was equitable, driven by the enormous demand rather than opportunistic greed. Nonetheless, these claims left an unforgettable mark, prompting public skepticism and demanding increased transparency in their enterprise. But overall, in navigating eras of war, prosperity and controversy, the DuPont family emerged not just as commercial magnates, but as multifaceted puppeteers, wielding considerable authority in both corporate boardrooms and political chambers. As the calendar pages flipped into the 20th century, the DuPont family's fortunes and dilemmas would evolve in parallel, with a seesaw-style existence of highs and lows that no one could have predicted. Now, the outbreak of World War I offered the DuPont family yet another stage for their mastery in explosives and gunpowder. Aligning with the Allied forces, they furnished indispensable war supplies, from explosives to other key materials. For the DuPonts, this was more than a commercial endeavor. It was a manifestation of patriotic zeal. Beyond supplying war materials, the family deployed their considerable wealth to ignite a flame of nationalism. For example, they underwrote war bonds and spearheaded patriotic events that invigorated the American spirit. Subsequently, their dual role of fortifying national defense and amassing immense profits was undeniable. With the government willing to pay a premium for quality war supplies, the DuPont coffers burgeoned. And in the Great Depression, an epoch marked by widespread financial devastation, the DuPont family demonstrated financial acumen and resilience, while many enterprises faltered. Specifically, their secret weapon was a canny investment in General Motors, or GM. Initiated in the 1920s, they had accumulated a dominant stake in GM by the decade's end. And despite the economic cataclysm that slashed sales in GM, the DuPonts remained unflinchingly committed to their investment. With strategic cash injections and managerial acumen, they buoyed GM during the Depression's bleakest hours. Their steadfast support wasn't merely optimistic. It was a well-considered gamble that ultimately yielded lavish dividends. As the American economy painstakingly resurrected itself, the fortunes of General Motors rebounded, and the value of DuPont's stake soared correspondingly. However, the latter part of the 1930s and the early 40s presented the DuPonts with judicial hurdles that challenged the very foundations of their empire. Accusations of breaching antitrust regulations, specifically in their gunpowder and chemical enterprises, loomed large. In response, the family countered vigorously, arguing that their operations were simply competitive strategies in a cutthroat market. But the federal government had its own agenda. In 1941, legal proceedings commenced against DuPont, unfolding in a protracted battle that would last years. Eventually, the government's unrelenting legal efforts culminated in the disassembly of the DuPont corporate structure into three distinct units, leaving questions open to whether the DuPont name could last into the modern era. Next, in the incipient years of the 1960s, the DuPont family found themselves at the vortex of an environmental maelstrom. The ecological fallout of their chemical operations was becoming increasingly hard to ignore, with air and water pollution linked to alarming health outcomes, including cancer. And initial attempts to dismiss these burgeoning concerns soon proved untenable. In 1962, a watershed moment materialized as the family established a specialized environmental protection division funneling substantial resources into eco-friendly technologies. To align their internal ameliorations with public perception, the DuPonts launched an expansive public relations offensive. Through meticulous ad campaigns and strategic sponsorships, they sought to project an image of corporate responsibility, keen to demonstrate their bona fide commitment to environmental safeguarding. 
By 1981, the DuPont clan orchestrated a masterstroke that echoed through business corridors, a successful acquisition of Conoco, a leading energy firm. Indeed, this strategic maneuver marked a seminal chapter in their diversification agenda and solidified their footprint in the flourishing energy sector. The melding of Conoco into the family's industrial empire provided an appreciable boost to their earnings and extended their global reach. Looking at the contemporary landscape, the DuPont lineage continues to be a paragon of influence, with tentacles spread across sectors like business, philanthropy and governance. Yet, the family's journey has been punctuated with episodes of disquietude. In the early 21st century, the DuPonts encountered a renewed wave of scrutiny, this time focused on the health implications of Teflon, their iconic non-stick substance utilized in cookware. Scientific investigations revealed unsettling connections between Teflon and various health disorders, casting aspersions on the family's legacy. Initially defiant, the DuPonts eventually bowed to the weight of evidence, acknowledging Teflon's potential health hazards. In 2005, a costly denouement unfolded as the family consented to a sizable settlement. $16.5 million dispensed to laborers exposed to Teflon toxicity. This was coupled with pledges to recalibrate manufacturing protocols to minimize Teflon emissions. While these upheavals cast a pall over their prestige and dented Teflon sales, the DuPont family's sustained influence remains indelible. Their capacity to navigate treacherous waters, whether environmental, financial or ethical, cements their status as one of America's most important old money families. Thus, from their initial footprints in France, to their groundbreaking enterprises on American soil, the family's contributions span a broad swath of domains, chemical innovations, strategic acquisitions, environmental stewardship, and even governance and philanthropy. Each generation of DuPonts has imbued new facets to an already multifaceted legacy, renewing and refreshing the family's imprint on myriad sectors. Their story stands as a paradigmatic example illustrating that even in the face of formidable challenges, resilience and ingenuity can carve a path to enduring relevance and influence. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Are you a native of the American East Coast and have seen or felt the presence of the DuPont name in your life? We know for a fact that many East Coasters are familiar with this dynasty. We look forward to hearing from you. And as always, thanks for joining us here for another episode. Cheers, until next time.